Good evening, everyone. I'm Dan McPhee, Executive Director of the Urban Design Forum, tuning in from Chinatown. It's really nice to beam into your homes and workplaces tonight and celebrate the most intrepid and patient and brilliant cohort of Forefront Fellows we've ever seen. They powered through Zoom and Gloom to create some wonderful work that you're going to witness tonight, so, so thank you all for joining us. And to get us started, I'm going to welcome on our new board president, Margaret Newman, to share a few words of welcome. Margaret, do we have you with us? Welcome. Do you do. Hey, Dan. Thank you. And uh, I was just in those lovely Chinatown offices um, earlier in the week, so I'm really excited that we're all kind of starting to get back in person. Um, so good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to welcome you, even though we are on Zoom, um, to celebrate the work of our Forefront Fellows. And we created the program because we believe that designers, developers, and civic leaders have a responsibility to address enduring injustice in the built environment. So this year, we gathered a diverse cohort of 26 outstanding and interdisciplinary urbanists to explore how to shape an inclusive green economy. And we investigated how to support minority-owned businesses and workers of color expand worker cooperatives and democratize economic resources. When we began planning this program in late 2019, the world was different. New York City had recently passed ambitious landmark legislation to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through the Climate Mobilization Act. And we knew that the city would need to transform its built environment through energy efficient building retrofits. And we also knew that in order to build towards a just green economy, these climate investments must benefit minority and women-owned businesses and workers of color. We didn't know that the pandemic would soon create new urgency for this project. And as we began to see the economic impacts of the pandemic hit low income communities and communities of color the hardest, the imperative to support minority owned small businesses, worker ownership and a green economy only grew. We were grateful to work with the office of the deputy mayor of Phil Thompson during the first phase of our fellowship to explore how to invest in MWBEs and employee owned businesses in the retrofit market. We spent three months studying forecasts for local law 97 implementation, surveying the retrofit market and understanding the needs of MWBE owners. Our fellows interviewed over 40 New York based and national experts to generate 10 creative proposals for a fairer and greener city. And equipped with this new knowledge, we invited our fellows to pursue independent projects that explore and advance diverse approaches to building an equitable green economy. They spent the next six months partnering with community organizations, interviewing experts, and developing resources. And tonight, you will hear the fellows present their projects on developing capacity for green entrepreneurship, building local power through composting, and innovating new financing models for green cooperatives. This is not the last step for these teams. We plan to support the teams moving forward and we hope all of you will provide them with constructive feedback and further ideas tonight. Thank you for being here and your continuing support for the work. And I am really excited to hear all of these proposals and I plan to hopefully use some of these things in the work that I'm doing. I hope you will all be able to do the same. So um, I'm going to turn it back over to Dan and uh, get the program started. Great. Thank you so much, Margaret. So tonight, uh, we are going to encourage everyone in the attendance to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Feel free to share ideas and accolades in the chat box. And if you'd like to connect with any of our teams for further discussion, please do let us know and we're happy to help. So first up, we're going to welcome our first team, Compost Works. So Compost Works, do we have you with us? Welcome everyone. Thank you, Dan. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Aiden Manasar, and I'm here with the Green Careers team. Polina Batiera, Darina Mayfield, Neil Muir, Karen Narevsky, and Matt Kinda. Our early collaborators in this work included Donna Hope and Isela Ramirez. In the spirit of cooperative works, we give you compost works. Uh, our efforts this uh, spring were focused on developing a model to grow green careers through sustainable entrepreneurship. 
And to do that, we partnered with Compost Power, the brainchild of Domingo Morales, who's also here with us tonight. Hey everyone, Domingo Morales from Compost Power, making compost cool and showing young adults how great of a career composting can be. Thank you, Domingo. Um, so we embarked on this journey with Domingo, who was brought up in New York City public housing and as an alum of Green City Force after considering the great opportunities that uh, public, infra public infrastructure offers for green career development um, in black and brown communities in New York City, particularly in public housing, where the infrastructure is ripe for transformation. Um, Compost Power's efforts to demystify composting and create jobs is part of a larger vision for neighborhood leadership and an inclusive economy. So our team landed on building capacity via four work streams that is hiring, training, marketing, and partnership building after reflecting on Compost Power's immediate needs and, and of course, those responses to some survey questions that we put together because we felt this would further the work that he was already doing and leverage each of our um, areas of strengths and networks to support him. With that, I'm gonna hand it off to my team members. We'll delve into those four uh, work streams more deeply. Thank you. Tarina. Thank you, Aiden. One of our goals was to connect Domingo to resources that would facilitate the hiring of qualified community members for a variety of on-site jobs including a site operator tasked with accepting and processing household food scraps and deploying the finished compost product for community greening projects, as well as a team manager position responsible for, for scheduling work days, volunteer sessions, and ensuring each site has the necessary resources to compost residential food scraps. We sought to strengthen the relationship between Compost Power and their training partner, Green City Force, and develop a pipeline of new workers ready to transition into internships and full-time employment opportunities. This partnership also revealed um, existing connections to NYSERDA programs and funding to help reduce the risk of hiring new, excuse me, to help reduce the risk of hiring and training new workers at Compost Power. Um, Matt? Thanks, Serena. To support Compost Power's growing staff and capacity, we work with Design Studio partner and partners to develop a set of educational materials that reflected Domingo's mission of making composting exciting and accessible. On the left, you'll see a set of posters that also double as on-site signage and provide an overview of the compost types you'll find on site and the tools that you need to manage and upkeep them. In addition to this, we developed a training guide that supports the new hires in their on-the-job training and helps them understand the roles and responsibilities necessary on site and helps manage volunteers and other staff on site as well. And with that, I'll pass it over to Polina to talk a little bit about our partnerships. Great, thank you, Matt. So Compost Power's goal is to build compost sites uh, across underserved communities uh, of New York City. And so we wanted to work with Domingo on uh, identifying a business and growth development strategy uh, to achieve that dream. As you can see on this slide, uh, Compost Power already has multiple sites in four of the five boroughs. And so Queens was our target borough. And of course, we know uh, in partnership building, we have to start with trust. Uh, however, it's a little hard to build trust and relationships when people are first uh, dealing with a global pandemic uh, and secondly are in a very active primary campaigning season. Nonetheless, uh, we work to identify gatekeepers uh, throughout the community. And we're currently in the process of connecting uh, with those gatekeepers to make inroads at both Queensbridge houses as well as Ravenswood houses uh, in Western Queens. And from there, uh, we look to continue uh, to build partnerships and to grow compost power across the borough. Uh, we also, of course, strengthened the connection with NYSERDA, as Dedina already mentioned, um, as well as with NYCHA. So Domingo's already plugged into the sustainability agenda um, and we're looking for opportunities uh, to collaborate with him uh, on capital initiatives. Um, but we also wanted to take small steps to systematically integrate compost power into a uh, nature developments, starting with things as simple as making sure uh, that Domingo can put up flyers to recruit volunteers um, as he expands his program. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Neil to talk a little bit about our takeaway. Thank you. Thanks, Paulina. So what you've just heard is a snippet of the four work streams our team developed with Compost Power. And reflecting on our role as partners, not business majors, we've seen how important, how important partnerships are to the development, growth, and success of minority and women-owned businesses in, in the beginning stages. 
So Domingo and Compost Power have demonstrated the, the power of these partnerships uh, through his existing relationships with Green City Forest, NYCHA, uh, NYSERDA, and now through the work that we've done, Partner and Partners and Urban, Urban Design Forum. And the, the two takeaways that we have that we can uh, dive deeper into when we talk about these partnerships is we found that those partnerships are strengthened when you know your landscape and you focus on your core services. So in the case of compost power, Domingo knows the composting landscape. He knows what connections and approvals are needed to procure a site. He knows who the people are who can help him with hiring and development. Uh, he knows what other methods are being done for composting and, and the methods that he uh, employs with, with his uh, with compost power. And he focuses on those core services. So he, he was focused on the Banner and Windrow compost systems in and on NYCHA campuses. And the second focus was to compost, uh, compost education and workforce development. And we found that when both of those things were in place, it made the goal very clear for all of us. And it made the partnerships even stronger when, when we were working with uh, everyone as a group. So that was our takeaway, but I'll let Domingo share with his own words. Yeah, um, I wanna start off by saying uh, it was amazing working with the fellows. You all are amazing. Um, and I just wanna say like my success wouldn't be there if Green City Force didn't invest in me. And that's why I plan to pay it forward by investing in other NYCHA residents and other young adults just like myself. But working with the fellows, I actually learned that as an entrepreneur, I have a lot going on in my mind. I want to get a lot done and a lot of ideas. But what they helped me do was they actually helped me hone in on training materials that I'm going to need to actually hire a team. Like I need more people to do all this amazing work that I'm going to be doing. So with the training materials, I can train the new staff that I'm bringing on board. I can train volunteers when they're on site and we can have a nice system throughout NYCHA that everyone knows how to use. So like it was an amazing opportunity to work with them. And they actually showed me that sometimes you just have to focus on something. And if you focus on that and you get it right, it helps to streamline all the other types of work that you wanna do as an entrepreneur. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Domingo. Um, we hope that you, our audience, after this, are compelled to research compost options yourself um, at home if you haven't already. Um, but most importantly, please share Compost Power's work with your networks. Um, you can find Domingo on Instagram at Compost Power. Tell your friends, your neighbors to follow. The people need to know about Compost Power. Um, and stay tuned because this website is going to be up in the next two weeks. Um, and you can sign up for volunteer opportunities um, in the future with Compost Power by emailing dmorales at compostpower.org. You can stay plugged in to, their, um, to the news about Compost Power, um, as well as, as, as I mentioned, volunteer opportunities. There's also a uh, community volunteer program with Green City Force at you know, the eco sites uh, on NYCHA grounds across the city. The form to get involved is on their website. I was just at Forest Houses last Saturday. It was invigorating. Um, but thank you everyone for your attention and we hope that um, to, to continue to elevate and uh, support Domingo's work through Compost Power. That's Compost Works. Great. Well done, guys. And let's hear it in the chat for Compost Power. Thanks, everybody. Next up, we're going to welcome into the Zoom room the Cooperative Business Roundtable team. Welcome everyone. Well, good evening everyone. And thank you all so much for joining us tonight, uh, especially because we are really excited to share the microsite and toolkit of the Cooperative Business Roundtable demystifying cooperative finance with you. But more on that in a second. My name is Jonathan Lane and I'm joined by colleagues that represent a true microcosm of the Forefront Fellowship hailing from housing, architecture, design, urban planning, real estate development, community development, and affordable clean energy development. 
And what brought together this diverse hodgepodge crew was a shared awareness that New York City has an enormous opportunity, an opportunity for an economic recovery that is fundamentally more equitable than the economy that came before it. An awareness that the post-COVID economic recovery and bold climate plans create an opportunity to rethink how we allocate resources in support of economic democracy for our most disenfranchised residents and workers. An economy where workers, especially black, indigenous, and people of color are more than budget line items to be minimized, but are themselves participants in profits and decision-making, are co-owners of their business, and have power over an otherwise extractive eco economy. And supporting employee ownership is already a burgeoning city priority, most recently codified in this year's State of the City and the launch of Employee Ownership NYC by Mayor Bill de Blasio in conjunction with Deputy Mayor Phil Thompson. And while there are a few different models for making businesses more equitable, our team felt that cooperatives went the furthest in giving workers equal representation and equal profit participation. So we started this project asking the fundamental question, what is currently the biggest barrier to expanding cooperatives as a business model? And after extensive stakeholder outreach, we heard one common refrain, financing cooperatives. So our topic became stated simply, cooperative finance. But when you hear me say that, how simple does that actually feel to you? For starters, we found that many businesses that are looking to start a cooperative or convert an existing business to cooperative ownership feel that the complexity seems like more of a burden than it's actually worth. And when we think about finance, a field seen as almost purposefully complex, the complexity leaves a lot of people punting tough questions and their solutions to the quote unquote experts. Admittedly, we were new to some of these concepts too. So we spent a lot of time talking to people in both cooperatives and finance, from worker owners to advocates to capital providers and others. And while we've explored every technical nuance from pipeline building to technical assistance and ecosystem development, very few people in this space feel fully fluent in both the concepts of cooperatives and finance, whether those that have spent many more years thinking about this stuff than we have, or relative newcomers like ourselves. And in practical terms, when one or both topics feel too hard to grasp, and the people who most need to understand them are busy, it leaves behind a relative dearth of solutions, which in this case manifests as something much larger, a gap in affordable, suitable, and accessible capital. So where most professional fellowships might encourage you to build on what you know, for our project, we decided to draw on our very inexperience, what we realized we didn't know, as a guide for where we should focus our time and effort. And so was born demystifying cooperative finance. So our first goal is to create an open source set of popular education materials for a variety of audiences to demystify both cooperatives and finance and understand why they haven't traditionally mixed. Our second goal is to use those materials to bring all audiences up to a baseline and then actually bring them together in a series of participatory workshops, thus co-creating equitable financial innovations to address the cooperative finance capital gap. We're calling this the Cooperative Business Roundtable. So on the former, we've generated tools contained on a microsite, which includes visuals developed by New York City-based cooperative creative and design firm Partners and Partners that serves to debunk and break down the complexity that is inherent to this space. And on the latter, we've researched best practices in equitable facilitation and convening strategies, drawing extensively from Black, Indigenous, people of color thought leaders like Adrienne Marie Brown. And we've prepared a plug and play facilitator's guide, complete with resources, runs of show, potential participant taxonomies, and supportive visuals. 
These tools would lead us to a series of roundtables that bring together at least two key groups. First, experts in lived experience, namely the would-be worker owners, BIPOC business owners, and cooperatives and solidarity economy advocates who can speak to the effects that this complexity has on their ability to become cooperatives. And second, technical experts, such as mission-aligned financiers, cooperative development support providers, and others who can only create viable new products by deeply understanding the challenges that these end users face. Once all is said and done, we believe good outputs of this series could include new financing products like cooperative specific credit enhancements, quasi equity, or other least extractive financial innovations, philanthropic grant strategies, as much as this can play a meaningful role in the capital stack, or even a coalition to advocate for a public financial institution like a public bank, whose mission could explicitly include cooperative finance. And most importantly, we know our role as fellows is time bound but we've designed this to reinforce those who are here and will be here long before and after us. So we're working with Deputy Mayor Phil Thompson's team who is best positioned to lead this work from the city side. And we've begun discussions with other key actors who can carry this work on beyond the political, current political administration. But this isn't just about an actor or two, it really takes a village to raise more, a more cooperative democratic economy. So what can you do? Well, first and foremost, you could visit our microsite, navigate to coopfinance.nyc to learn more about our work, our approach, and some of the tools we've developed to help demystify cooperative finance. And there will be a uh, rolling out of more and more materials in the next few days. And second, you can start using these tools to embed employee ownership principles right into your own workplace. Whether you are thinking about conversion to a co-op or not, there are many ways to spread the wealth, increase worker voice, and engage in equitable succession planning. And if this work is deeply aligned with your own, you can attend events and start getting involved in the work New York City is doing to grow cooperative, cooperative employee ownership, especially initiatives like Employee Ownership NYC and the New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives or NICNOC. So we believe that making economic opportunities more equitable isn't only about making more of something. It's about making that thing more accessible for those for whom it's designed. And we found that expanding employee-owned businesses fundamentally begins with making employee ownership itself more intelligible and therefore more accessible. And that's precisely what our proposal seeks to do. Thank you all so much. Great, thank you all so much. Bravo, brava. Let's hear it in the chat for Co-op Business Roundtable. Well done, everybody. And now I am going to welcome on our final team, Rooted Resiliency. Welcome everyone. Good evening all. We're very excited to be concluding tonight's fantastic set of presentations. And while our colleagues have focused on specific aspects of supporting organizations, what we are most interested in is how to make these systems more human or people centric. So what does that even mean, focusing on people? We asked ourselves that question and want to ask the same of you, ask that same question to you. Please take 10 seconds and type the first thing that comes to your mind in the chat box. Okay, I see some answers in the chat. Um, and here are some answers from community organizers who were actively addressing challenges on the ground during this pandemic. At the core of this feedback is the idea that we need to build community power, and that means strengthening local communities and infrastructure networks to empower and set bottom-up initiatives to succeed. Last year, a number of our large and centralized infrastructure systems struggled to operate at full capacity, 
One example is the Department of Sanitation, who had to halt their curbside composting and food waste collection program. And that's when organizations like BK Rot stepped up to fill the gap. And over the last few months, we worked with this community supported and fossil fuel free food waste hauling and composting service who really see themselves as community partners. Through their operations, they are advancing values of environmental justice and creating space for youth leadership in communities of color while creating a localized green economy. Not only did BKROD continue to provide uninterrupted local services to existing users, they also accommodated a much wider community of users whose services were discontinued by a centralized waste management system. These green dots here on the map show how much wider their network expanding, expanded outside of that orange circle. Um, but this expansion didn't necessarily translate into scaling bigger. On the contrary, they created a network of mini infrastructure loops with other organizations so that resources and the work could be shared. These mini infrastructure loops proved to be a lot more accessible and effective in distributing services. It also forced us to challenge centralized supply of services and the production of goods, which inherently tend to support top-down funding priorities and policies that are out of sync with round realities. We found that organizations like BKROT are operating on a very different model, one which is far from a traditional approach of providing services to extract profit. This model embraces the idea of abundance versus scarcity, of equal exchange, of networking and partnering versus competing. And because of how deeply these organizations are rooted in the network of surrounding communities and businesses, they're keenly aware of and care about local needs. And that is what makes them so effective. These concepts are what we used to define rooted resiliency. Rooted resiliency explores ways to build community power through connected hyper-local networks. It anticipates a post-capitalist vision of a shared participatory economy that embraces the idea of abundance to form harmonious relationships versus an emphasis on scarcity and competition focused on unequal exchange, which is typical of our understanding of economics today. Andrew will now walk us through how these local networks can be strengthened and how we can empower bottom-up initiatives to succeed and give them staying power in the long run as they address the green transition and climate change. Thank you, Shachi. <clears throat> so we put on a series of engagement activities with BKROT and the local community. We engage directly with workers, users, neighbors, board members, and executive staff of BKROT through a series of design and mapping workshops, as well as in-depth one-on-one conversations. What became clear were the challenges, benefits, and needs to strengthen bottom-up initiatives like BKROT and move us closer to a vision of resilient local power. But we can't get to resilient local power without centering local voice. With the executive staff and youth leaders of BKROT, as well as a local representative, Jalissa, Kenya, Bushwick native, and the owner of the adjacent property, we embarked on a process of collaborative design to create an accessible and functional space for composting operations in public use. Our takeaway, offer holistic solutions for communities to evolve as one rather than just providing services to extract profit. With this in mind, we co-created site design concepts and programming specific to BK Rot aimed at strengthening their networks of users and collaborators. The image on the left is the existing site. The image on the right is an example of one of our site design proposals generated during our engagement event to help articulate our concepts to BK Rot. We proposed a base design of the existing site to maximize its current utility. This layout consisting of an outdoor kitchen, shade structure, and an area for compost piles enables for flexible programming of scenarios that serve the various interconnected communities that BK Rot connects with. These programmatic scenarios are our recommendations with specific communities and activities in mind. Assembly. Event space, food pantry, 
<laughs> learning. Fundraising. Exchange. Local agriculture. And cultural engagement. Among the principal considerations which loosely frame these recommendations were community outreach and partnerships, historical and agricultural education, and celebrating local cultural traditions. As a team of planners, designers, architects, strategists, this project was how we, as in Jordan Channer, Andrew Harris, William Shi, Sheila Ling, Stephanie Loomis, Priya Mogankar, Shachi Pandey, Alexandra Patty Diaz, Ebony Williams explored the ways we can be conduits in service of fostering local networks and participatory planning, this rooted resiliency. It is clear that constraints are resources like land, financial support from public agencies, and nascent local networks. Removing these barriers will move us closer to a vision of resilient local power. We want to end on this question. How can you leverage your resources to build rooted resiliency in your communities? We all have roles to play in this transformation towards a post-capitalist vision of a shared participatory economy. As Marco Partis said, on the ground organizers should be the architects of the recovery. As planners, architects, designers, we're not taught to be organizers. We should start by placing ourselves on the power map and be in service. We need to strive to build organizational capacity for our communities. We need clear and innovative avenues from government agencies for participatory resource, budget, general planning in response to local needs. As a member of the community, we need to be aware of our choices and how they affect our critical local initiatives, such as ordering from Amazon versus visiting a local store. Is convenience really more important than community? So again, how can you build rooted resiliency within your community. Thank you very much. Great, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Let's hear it in the chat for rooted resiliency. But, but really, congratulations everyone and, and thank you so much. Um, we're really quite fortunate actually to have two, two esteemed respondents with us tonight. We've got Kizzy Charles Guzman and Tanya Gale with us tonight. So I'm gonna invite them to turn their videos and microphones on. Welcome, Kizzy, Hi. and welcome, Tanya. So I'm going to read your bios just so everyone knows who the hell you are. So Kizzy Charles Guzman is a deputy director at the New York City Mayor's Office of Climate and Sustainability. Previously, she served as the deputy director for social resiliency at the Mayor's Office of Resiliency and as director of the Climate Change and Public Health Program at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Proof of her brilliance includes the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Environmental Quality Award and a Champion of Change Award from the White House. Welcome back, Kizzy. Hi. And, and uh, we're also thrilled to be joined by Tanya Gale. Welcome, Tanya. You made it. Tanya is the Executive Director of Green City Forests, an organization training young leaders to power a green and inclusive economy through service. Previously, she held leadership positions with the New York City Housing Authority and the Sponsors for Educational Opportunity Career Program. She spent most of her career in nonprofit organizations focused on economic justice for young people of color. So welcome, Tanya. All right, I'm going to start with you, uh, Tanya. So we've heard we've heard tonight about the power of hyperlocal initiatives mm -hmm. and the need for policy, finance, and capacity building that supports solutions at scale. So Green City Forests, your organization, operates these site-based programs, but you've got this tremendous vision of citywide networks and systemic change. So I'd love to hear from you. How do you advance community ownership while also building a more verdant and just city? Great. Well, first of all, I'm really excited to be here tonight with all these amazing change agents and leaders of the future. So thank you for having me and, and DCF and um, really, really happy to be part of this, this conversation. Um, so the way our model works is that anytime we take on an initiative within a community, we try to be as intentional as possible and purposeful in connecting with the key stakeholders, the residents who live in the community, other folks that are part of um, drivers of decision and support. And so we 
look to have a framework that's around service and workforce opportunities and behavior change, but from the lens of each local space. So we take this frame and we deploy it across the different sites and then, and then spend continu continual time through focus groups, engagements, food, food distribution, you name it, all kinds of engagement with the community uh, to understand what their priorities are as we build opportunities for them to consider what we are thinking of doing and how we look at things and then like leaving room to adjust and edit based on the inputs from the folks who are, who are living where we're working. Perfect, sounds, sounds about right. So Kizzy, I'm gonna turn to you. Uh, we're thinking about how to build a green economy and that's pretty urgent. But at the same time, we know that the transformation that's going to be required to make the city sustainable and resilient is not going to happen overnight. So how are you working to advance this and how would you like to see our city government lead in the next five years? Yeah, um, well, first of all, hi, everybody. And congratulations to all the fellows. Um, I want to thank uh, UDF, the Urban Design Forum, for inviting me today, um, but also to thank them for their dedication and their partnership to this administration and all the work that they do and they have done with us to imagine and create new and innovative policies that help to fight climate change, but also address racial equity. I was involved in a project with, um, with them um, what feels now like eons ago because it was pre-pandemic, but um, around urban uh, heat island effect and, and, and heat resiliency. Um, and I'm always just thrilled uh, to see the creativity and, and the work and the passion that the fellows bring. Um, so thank you uh, for your work and, and, and for everything that you presented today, super interesting. Um, let me just say that you are absolutely right that this transformation will not happen overnight, right? So over the last few years, we've mandated carbon emissions reductions in existing buildings and required solar panels and cool roofs and green roofs on new buildings. We have enabled the financing to get the work done. It, you know, it, it's slow, it's slow, but we are setting a national standard, right? For fighting climate change and trying to actualize a greener and healthier New York. I would say we're on a path to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 and a 100% clean electricity by 2040. We are expanding our renewable energy um, at significantly. In fact, there's 12 times more solar in New York City today than there was in 2013. And we have enough solar installed across the city to meet the needs of over 70,000 households. And there's still so much left to do. So here's what I'd like to see. One, uh, we have to deliver, right, on the Climate Mobilization Act. In five years, we'll have a couple of years of Local Law 97 compliance under our belts. And I'm hoping that building owners will be investing in deep energy retrofits and solar and green roofs, right? Um, I hope we experience better indoor and outdoor air quality, increased thermal comfort in a warming world, um, lower energy cost burden and, and, and better health. I just, I hope that there is a thriving and inclusive retrofit industry that can help us actualize uh, those goals. Um, I'd also like to see city government leading by example, right? Like we have have to ensure that our own buildings are not only compliant with the laws, but actually utilizing innovative technology and clean carbon free fuels. Um, and in order to actualize this vision, we're going to need to continue to plan for a changing climate, but also protect local law 97 from carve outs in the immediate term and address the building types that were exempted from the main provisions of the law. So um, we also need to plan for a pipeline of workers and firms to deliver on those retrofits. And the last thing I'll say is that the state is not off the hook, right? Obviously COVID-19 disproportionately impacted people of color um, would increase rates of illness and death, job loss and, and business closures. But even before COVID, New York State's clean energy industry was over 70% white and over 70% male. So as we're rebuilding, we can't just restore what was lost during COVID. We have to address the injustices that caused those disparities in the first place, which is why I'm so excited to see the work of the fellows. As an initial step, the city advocated for state legislation to increase the discretionary spending cap for MWBEs and allow the city to require its contractors to hire from high poverty zip codes with what is called community hiring. Um, unfortunately, those bills did not pass in the current legislative session, but we don't want to give up on our efforts to expand opportunity in the coming years. I hope you will join us in, 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 in asking and advocating for that. Uh, so that's what I'd like to see happen then. Great, thanks Kizzy. It is definitely a new chapter, so we, there's real opportunity here. Yeah. We are, of course, living in a time of three-part revolution though, right? We're living in the time of the climate awakening, the racial justice reckoning, 
and just the beginning now of an economic recovery. So I guess the question I want to ask the two of you is, what does it mean to have been in that work all along and finally have the world wake up to it? So maybe we can start with you, Tanya. It's a great question. Um, thank you for that question. I mean, my, my high road answer is that's fantastic. And let's make sure we leverage this moment and make sure that, you know, we take advantage of naming that there are all of these organizations and entities and community that have been doing the work for decades and longer and have the expertise. Um, my less high road answer is like, it's about time because decades and decades of work has been happening in this space for a really long time. No, but in all seriousness, um, it's critical that systems change takes a really long time. And this is an unfortunate example of that, but uh, uh, you know, it's a major milestone. And I think we have to be as collective and intentional as possible to maximize the moment. And, and, and like, you're, you know, like Kizzy's talking about backing up the laws and, and giving insight and support into how to make those laws and rules and attention translate into progress and sustainability and long-term quality outcomes, not just checking a box for the moment. Um, so I'm excited about it, but I, I'm also real about us needing to continue to push even more now than ever <laughs> so that it gets multi as leveraged as, as best as possible. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, of course, Tanya just took the words right out of my mouth, right? <laughs> like, listen, I, to that, I say, welcome to the party, but where have you been? <laughs> okay, like, listen, I'm, I'm into the idea of more of us fighting for justice and for ideas like self-realization and social equity to be accepted as key goals in our day to day, right? It's really exciting that more people are taking an interest and becoming very knowledgeable on complex topics. But I don't want us to stop at the performance of this wokeness, okay? I need everyone to move past knowing and onto acting. So we ask ourselves each day, how does my work help further social equity? How does my day-to-day -day support healthy and thriving communities, right? And I do think that there's an equity-focused notion of community resiliency taking root. We want to create communities that can bounce forward, right? By responding to challenges in ways that address the root causes of, of instability and the disruptions we've had, right? But we want, that, that's the part I'm most interested in, like the way that this work can serve as the critical engine for a just recovery and self-determination. And I just want to say that like, government has a strong role to play on that, but we do need the private and nonprofit sectors because green jobs are about self-determination and the people most impacted by environmental degradation cannot often trust the very systems that have advanced and allowed their oppression, right? Um, so by having community members train each other on ways to achieve a clean and green economy, resiliency and sustainability, and then be able to work on their buildings and home communities, we can ensure that transformation. So what I'm saying is that to strengthen the social and economic fabric of our neighborhoods, we need everyone. So welcome to the party and where have you been? <laughs> that sounds about right. That sounds about right. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that we really did focus on in this, in this program was how do we kind of build the partnerships across public, private, and nonprofit stakeholders? And in so doing, also empower communities to take leadership. So maybe Tanya, I can turn to you first. How do, how do you advise us to build a bigger tent and draw some new resources to the table? Well, I think, I mean, uh, you know, all joking aside, it, it is important that in fairness to the people who are coming to the dance late, uh, we want everyone to be successful in this work. And so part of the work is actually being intentional and helpful and explaining, you know, okay, your idea of a green economy might be X, Y, Z, but here are all the different factors that you may not be considering that we know from experience and the partners know from experience uh, need to be included, right? So, so part of the partnership is like understanding the different layers and the complexities of what it takes or rather it's workforce, whether it's green. And it's it's also motivating communities to buy into why there's value in, in making these choices and, and standing up to, you know, living up to these rules and regulations. And so nothing is gonna be sustainable if there's not community buy-in. And so there has to be intention and respect and appreciation for how we move into spaces and then invite everyone to be part of a solution. And so that lands in, where does the funding come in? Where does the policy come in? All the different partners. Um, but it has to be holistic 
approach. It's complicated content, which you have to sort of simplify to message the need for, but then you've got to like roll up your sleeves and really do the work of engaging with all the different stakeholders and hearing the different priorities so that you can have a plan that actually makes sense in the long run. Yeah, Kizzy, how do you how do you want to see city government get a, a whole lot more aggressive in bringing together some diverse stakeholders? And, yeah, and yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, listen, collaboration is essential, right? So to actually realize the just transition, as as Tanya said, like we have to align the policy and training, the job placement, the capacity building, the business development programs, and vice versa, right? So it requires a variety of different expertises, but a, a lot of coordination. The forefront report really pointed out that, that much of the retrofit and decarbonization work will be done by the private sector, where city policies around MWBEs and local hire rules don't apply, right? So we are taking steps to address our own spending, and, and, and yet we are still well positioned to address the private sector. So I just want to provide one example of one program that we just launched that I'm really excited about. Um, it's called Electrify Staten Island, um, and we're trying to promote the use of air source heat pumps and one to four family homes. What I like about this program is that it's designed to address the carbonization goals by providing outreach and education and technical assistance to for homeowners, but also to promote just workforce outcomes. And we're doing that by piloting a new strategy for workforce development with two goals. First, we are connecting MWBE, small business firms, and other priority populations to no cost trainings from manufacturers so that they're able to perform high quality installs and qualify for utility and statewide incentive programs. And we will provide hands-on assistance for them to obtain those certifications. And we'll also provide assistance for qualifying firms to register as MWBEs with the city. So we need to be able to, to hold hands and, 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 and bring everyone together and, and help connect to the resources that exist. Second, we're working with the Department of Small Business Services to connect these firms to relevant business development resources and courses so they're able to be competitive in the market and achieve their full capacity. We're also encouraging many of these firms uh, to take advantage of NYSERDA workforce incentives to hire interns and fellows. So the point is that in all of that initiatives, we're, we've increased coordination with city and external partners that are focused on wealth building for workers and business owners who have historically faced barriers to economic development and industry connections and advice. So lastly, I just want to shout out Ellie and Nikki from my team for working really hard and thoughtfully on this. And we know there is a lot more work to do, but it's so necessary. Well, let's let Staten Island lead for a change. That sounds great. The other opportunity, of course, that I want to talk to you guys about is that we finally might possibly have a federal government with some commitment to addressing climate change. So what do you think new federal priorities might make possible here in New York? And, and let's, let's start with you, Tanya. Sure, thank you. Um, so yeah, everywhere I go, right? Uh, Civilian Climate Corps, that's what we hear everywhere. So that's, it, that's great. That's great. Um, uh, not to be a broken record, but I think you know what's critical is it's got to be a long-term plan. It's got to consider all the stakeholders. But I will say that um, you know we have a vision of what we call um, eco hubs within public housing right now in our work, and so we have farm spaces that are layered. Um, in addition to food production, there are other pieces of the, the hub model, which includes workforce development, community engagement, participation. We've done um, intentional programming with Hester Street to be um, evidence-based in our resident input. And so we basically have these eco hubs that we see as a vision that can happen across New York City and beyond and federal investments for things like climate cores and a long term plan could be a release a trigger to make those things real literally across the city. Um, so that's one way I would think of it. And then clearly, again, within that, it's an employment, it's good jobs. It's not just an entry level job. It's like a, a structured path towards progress and growth for the individuals as well as um, you know the stakeholders in terms of the community outcomes like the individual success and resiliency as well as the vibrancy of the transformation of communities which in our mind was would be through the eco hub model yeah interesting sounds perfect i, I can imagine eco hubs everywhere you can come see you can see four of them in night let us know come on down <laughs> Like what, what about you, Kizzy? What do you think new federal priorities might make possible? 
You know, um, there's a lot of energy around big infrastructure projects in transportation and energy, and I think they're incredibly necessary, right? And the federal government typically delivers on these types of projects. But if the federal government only funds large and shovel ready projects, then it's likely that the big firms that are super established will win that work and reproduce the race and gender disparities of the current market. So I'd like to see the federal government treat our housing as public infrastructure in the same way that bridges and wind farms are, right? Like we need small buildings to decarbonize, but low and moderate income homeowners will need help. So affordable housing will need help and helping them decarbonize helps all of us. So large infrastructure, but also small residential investments, each create different types of jobs, which may allow for firms of different size and specialty to benefit from federal action. So I'd like to see that. Third, at, you know, I hope that the federal government ties funding for workforce and small business development directly to that capital and infrastructure spending so that we can ensure that job training results in immediate job placement and the small businesses can obtain the, the necessary certifications and insurance and capital that they need to be able to bid on these big projects, right? Um, and I'd like to see these programs directly address systemic racism or other forms of oppression. For example, by pairing investments with preferential access to affordable small business loans or different bonding requirements for NWBEs or trainings that provide additional resources for wraparound services for justice involved populations. So many of the recommendations from this report because they were so bomb. Um, so anyhow, that I, the last thing I'll say is that as the fellows found the better conversation is not only about jobs, it's about jobs and ownership, right? So ownership of land and resources, companies, cooperatives, housing, and as the federal government thinks about the National Climate Corps, they should also be thinking about a national movement to shift ownership if the goal is to authentically repair damage and prevent inequitable futures. Sounds pretty enlightened to me. Let's do it. Yes, so, so in a moment, I'm just going to invite on a couple of our forefront flows to actually pose a question of you guys. But my last question to you is, how can our broader community of designers, developers, advocates, and public officials help you build a verdant and just city? So let's start with you, Tanya. Um, well, I think I think of you all in this community as the, you know, the current and future drivers of city decisions tied to all of this work, right? And so that's a really exciting, um, I'm really excited about that. But um, I think really continuing to connect to all of these organizations that are out here doing that work, whether that's through, you know, volunteering or doing what you're doing with, you know, BK Rock and, and Domingo and others, like really like being connected to the work directly so that you can rightfully tap the, the thought leaders and expertise to help solve for issues. And you can also be connected in like lived experience, like understanding what the work is like front, you know, front row hands on. So it's that trusted partnership with the, um, the, the implementers where you build a relationship that's genuine so that you can exchange with each other, you know, the values of what you need to like keep the, keep the work moving because it is complicated and it is layers. And sometimes you need to build a plan that connects, you know, one organization doing something completely different to get to the end of the, of the, of the pathway. And so you have to understand like what your toolkit is and what your resources are out there. And then you have to be trusted by that community to, for them to want to support and engage what you're doing. And, and more importantly, help edit to make it better because they're actually doing the work. So whether you're joining boards or volunteering or helping to amplify the work of other organizations or also connecting them to each other, we're part of something that we helped found with a couple of other workforce groups and Jobs First called the Green Economy Network. And that's across the city. All of these experts in workforce and employment and policy and others that are coming together very thoughtfully to try to, as a group, message, okay, what is the way forward? And city partners come to us and have these conversations so that we're having real honest discussions and pain points. And so we're all speaking the same talk and we're all understanding the priorities. And I think that's the way forward. And this group is primed to be driving all of that through your, through your brand and your talent and your proven outcomes. Like I would just say, keep it up and keep connected, please. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'll just add that 
we absolutely need this group and the broader community to just continue advocating for the recommendations of the report, whether that's with the city, state, your institutions that you're a part of, the federal government, right? Like well, there are a couple of needs here. And, and one is like, help some of the wonks in the energy sector understand the report findings. I think we're so siloed often, right? Like in, in terms of, of the work that we do and it's hard to know everything. And so I think that because each of you comes from such a diverse background of organizations and, and, and folks that have real uh, stakes in decision-making that you can help us understand the report's findings and why they're so critical. Um, and, and lastly, then keep pushing for ambitious climate policy at all levels of government, right? Um, we are, in order to get to an equitable, equitable climate economy, we're going to need strong climate policies paired with labor and contracting policies, right? So that we can have investments right here in New York City. So I, I'd love to see the continued push, um, but let's not just stop at the press release or when the policy is on, on the books, Let, let's continue in that implementation phase. And, and I think each of the fellows through the organizations that they're a part of can continue pushing uh, for ambitious um, solutions. And I actually just want to love to add, because you made me think of something else I definitely think is important, which I, maybe we all take for granted, but I'm gonna name it, which is that, you know, being messengers of what priority populations being needed talent, like the quality and the, and the necessary connection of priority populations, uh, M MWBs, the marginalized folks who've been historically kept out. It's not, it's like, helping, I, I thought of this when you mentioned the wonks, right? <laughs> helping people understand that this is not like, oh, a good idea, but it's actually uh, added value that's critical for the, for, for the future, right? And so um, just hailing what we know is true, which is like you have amazing talent and potential that needs to be lifted and prioritized to be drivers of this vision going forward, not just sort of along for the ride or included, but literally being the drivers of change. Um, so I think that's a really important role that this group in particular has great power to message effectively. Yes. Sounds good. We'll, we'll try our best to keep it up, but but you both too, really like the work that you guys are doing is such- We're in it, we're in it. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you. So I'm gonna welcome on a couple of our Forefront fellows to join the conversation. So first up, I'm gonna welcome on Addison Botters. Addison. Welcome, welcome. Hi, um, Tanya and Kizzy, thank you so both so much for the work you do and for your words this evening. Um, uh, my question is first directed towards Tanya, although Kizzy, please follow after. I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, I noticed that um, a number of the board members for Green City Forest come from finance. And as you heard earlier, some of the fellows have been thinking critically about the role of finance in advancing economic democracy and adjusting climate change. So as a leader working with those in finance towards the same goals, I would just, yeah, I'd love to hear your reflections on the role of finance in achieving climate and economic justice. Thank you for that question. Um, a few things, first I'll say, I have been very thankful to have an incredibly uh, connected and committed uh, group of board members historically. Um, I also need to just state that uh, there's been a very intentional plan, which is in play now, that's been set up for a couple of years now, pre-2020, about expanding and uh, diversifying and broadening our board membership representation. I'm happy to say all of my board members Absolutely agree. So just to put that out there, we're working on some uh, added um, compliments to our the financial strength of our board. Um, and then I, I have to be honest in where like my previous to this position, I was driving fundraising for six years and, and before. So finance is real. Uh, I mean, you know, if, if I believe highly in the power of public private partnerships and, you know, it's leveraging the resources that you know can be invested to make the change and getting the right people at the table who have the power and then trying to work on relationships in a way where you can actually not sh shift the power, but name the other p other types of power that are complementary to the financial power. I think that's the work, right? Because at the end of the day, you need the money, but you can't have the money only be being the only power. Otherwise, there won't be justice and there won't be sustainability. So this is not an easy. It is not an easy um, movement, um, but it's important and and 
it's it, you need you need finance at the table. And I would say, like in lots of other examples, once you get the one or two right voices that can help be the messengers to like convince transition with the others, I think that is the way forward. So like finance is real. It cannot continue to be the only driver. We have to create spaces, whether they're co-ops or you know ownership within communities that is desperately needed and needs to shift. Um, maybe thinking, you know, from a venture capital perspective, like getting appetites for folks to invest in communities to be cooperatives and drivers of, of financial creation themselves is something, you know, we've been thinking a lot about, but tons more work to do on that and uh, love to talk offline with you because I'm guessing you probably have some ideas yourself. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Addison. Any, any, anything you would want to add, Kizzy, or should we welcome our next? You know, I, I, I don't have much more to add. Finance is not my field, and yet um, I, it's such a big part of, of the retrofit work that needs to happen, right? So we launched the, the New York City Accelerator Pace Financing Program, and we just, you know, uh, we're finally able to do our first loan. I think that announcement came out, what, yesterday or the day before? You know, I, um, I, I think, again, we need everyone. And I think conventional financing is a way that we uh, help decarbonize, but also we need uh, different types of loans and different types of products that um, can be repaid in, in different ways that actually help to spur um, and you know the the energy uh, efficiency projects that we want to see in the existing building stock, right? So I think um, I uh, I can appreciate that there's just so much work that needs to happen and, and engagement that needs to happen with the finance sector because at the end we need all the tools in the toolbox and new tools uh, to be created in order for us to actually make it a reality so that building owners are not just stuck uh, with policy that they cannot. Um, act upon, right? So we can't get to our carbon goals if ultimately landlords are not um, making those retrofits and actually not investing in the technologies that are needed. So, um, yep, it's a, it's, a, it's a growing area of, of concern and work, and, and we're really proud of the work that the Accelerator team is doing on that. And the other piece I would add, Addison, is that, um, you know, we're doing some of this work currently at the, with the state level in partnership with NYSERDA and some others and social impact, but, you know, the city can be really instrumental in like um, navigating some pay for success and social impact partnerships that could really be timely given all of this climate investment happening. And, and that I think would be a, a really good way to have maximum impact you know it's 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 harder with the smaller groups doing it although we're all trying but if there was like again a macro collective plan that was about okay here's what the here's what the pay for success of this investment needs to look like for the city to hit this this like milestone of of, of progression that could be a really exciting way to leverage um invest basically if you know we do it we've done it in real estate for decades right like let's think about it in terms of like um actual social change like what is that investment um and what should that look like so thank you very much great thanks addison so next up i'm going to welcome on ebony wiggins ebony do we have you with us yes you do hi tanya hi kizzy thank you so much for your insights today um, I know that both of you have spoke about engaging community stakeholders and the importance of community buy-in and collaboration being essential. So my question to you both today, and Kizzy, you also mentioned kind of addressing some of the root cause causes to um, instability and inequality. Sorry, um, the 15 minute neighborhood group is chiming away <laughs> in the background. Um, so my question is, um, how do we kind of build local power and how can local organizations find their own power in increasingly regionalized, globalized world? Like how are we kind of really um, providing communities with autonomy and power from the ground up? Why don't I start? I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, because you know, it's, it's a hard question, right? Like I would say as a city bureaucrat, Folks always think it like direct the question, like what can city government do to facilitate that? And to me, I think that this is part of the self-determination self piece. It's like communities actually also need to uh, coalesce and, and self-organize. And I think that that's what makes the work so powerful as opposed to a top-down approach. So I think the government's role might be in providing the spaces, right? Um, to to, for, to facilitate that community conversation and to facilitate that community power to, to grow. But I think that at the end, 
um, our local uh, nonprofits, our community uh, boards, our um, neighborhood associations, these can also be sources of energy and convening and, and thinking, right? And so I, I just, I love the idea of um, communities coming together on their own and, and, and then holding government's feet to the fire. Like that's, that's, the, that's the job, right? Like so everything from voting to just straight up advocacy. Like I, I think that this, these policies only get better and better when we actually have communities pushing for what they want and what they need. Um, and community boards, I, I'm seeing the chat, are absolutely not very representative, but also many of us are also not like wanting to like get and be appointed, right? So like I have been to so many community board meetings and been there until 11 p.m. and then been like, whoo, I never wanna be in a community board. So like, I can't have it both ways, right? I'm, I'm, I was in my buildings co-op and I was like, whoo, I can't, I can't with so many meetings, I have for no time, but then I'm pissed at the policies that they came up with, right? So like in so many ways, we really have to roll up our sleeves on the side what are my passion points? Where are my huge like areas of contribution? Where are my talents? And how can I best make my time? Um, again, like be the thing that um, helps me get up in the morning and feel happy about the work I do day to day, but also contributes to healthy and thriving communities, right? So like, what are those spaces? If it's not the community board, is it your local nonprofit? If it's not that, is it your local something else, right? Like what, what kind of work can I contribute to um, in order to, to affect the change? But I, I really do think it's, it's everyone. It's everyone fighting against the, the systemic um, issue and, and, and we're part of that system. And so we all need to, to help change that. For sure. I was just looking through the chat and yeah, it's like tackling polarization of ideas and disinformation. Yes, that's real. Um, yes. You know, to echo Kizzy, look, there, you're, you know, think about a family, think about, you know, like there are always going to be groups where everyone doesn't agree. I think what, what we're trying to hold fast to is that making sure everyone in the community is part of a conversation. And like, you know, to Kizzy's point, if they're collecting um, like-minded thoughts from other community members, then they're building coalition and they're building their own power. And the people I know that are strongest in the different communities we work with, you know, residents I can go to and, and I go to them to ask for help with the electeds in their community because they know who everybody is and they know what's going on and, and because they've done the work. They have gone to the meetings and they have been, you know, walking around the neighborhood and they do know who everybody is and they know who their allies and advocates are. So it's, it's never, I think our, our job is to really create a space where we're naming and respecting that that is our intention and inviting community to step into that space and then doing our best to support what that looks like. And for, you know, somebody like a Domingo, he's successful because he's offering something. He's creating opportunity, not just through jobs, but through power and through like addressing a system change. And those types of things are motivating, but then each community is then, you know, determining to him, like what it looks like where they live. So it's not easy. It's not easy. I think the intention has to be um, articulated clearly. And then part of, part of it is like literally letting go of power and sometimes just showing, like demonstrating that you're not in charge and, and, and creating space for others. Um, but I don't make any pretense that we've mastered it, um, but we're doing a lot of work again in partnership with Hester Street, in partnership with our participants who come from communities and, and our graduates who we ask to like help us design solutions and tell us what the priorities are. And then they go and ask the other members of the community what are important. So trying to have credible messengers in whatever you're talking about from the spaces, I think is the first step beyond anything else. And then um, sometimes you've got to let it play out and let the community <laughs> decide, um, uh, you know, with, with some frames of support. But ultimately, if you don't have the power, then it's not up to you and it needs to be up to them. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Ebony. Thank you both. Thank you, Daniel. All right, and last up, we're gonna welcome on Karen Narevsky. Karen, welcome, Karen. Great, thanks, Dan, and thanks so much, Kizzy and Tanya. It's been really great to hear from you, and congratulations to all the other fellows. Really enjoyed hearing everyone's presentation and being part of the event. Um, so I actually wanted to ask a question, um, sort of thinking about um, the development of 
green careers, which is what my team was focused on, and really the whole enterprise of workforce development more broadly, really requires kind of a delicate balance of the needs and interests of employers, both existing mm -hmm. employers and the potential employers um, that maybe folks are trying to bring in to the workforce world with the needs of workers themselves. Um, and so there's some really interesting challenges there. There obviously are places of, of convergence and also points of divergence. And so I'm curious to hear from either or both of you um, how you approach doing this work in a way that addresses the power imbalances and really allows for continued growth of workers and um, tries not to replicate uh, some of the inequalities that really are embedded in our labor system and in the way we think about work. Well, I can I can start. Um, well, this is definitely something we think about. I think about every day. <laughs> it's very real. It's like, how do you live in a capitalist world and address <laughs> the systemic racism and injustices of capitalism, right? <laughs> and so the short answer is it starts with understanding who are the actual good examples of employer partners and how do you try to keep that going and use it as a model for others, right? And so part of it is being honest, again, back to what I said previously, like not, um, you have to name the needs of what systemic you know, racism and justices have caused in terms of barriers for people to be successful. You have to name those things to people who may not be clear as an employer partner, but in a way that's affirmative and not deg degradating of the candidates. And then you have to challenge the employers to like recognize that they're getting value. And so it's in their interest to work in partnership with us as workforce providers to understand the pain points, to try to be intentional about understanding as much as possible upfront, what are the needs and talent expectations so that we can be um, clear, A, in providing that for the candidates, ideally ahead of time, but then also naming where the where the gates and the bumps are. I mean, NYSERDA is also particularly great at this, right? They, they understand with workforce partners that there are many steps that they have to help support. It's not always coming just from the employer. So it, it it's partly relationships, it's partly, naming bad actors, honestly, um, and trying as much as possible to lead with the carrot, which means when you find the good partners and you're, and you're talking to them about what you're talking to your participants about, like we have a whole like model of liberation, but we're not like in a bubble and like unrealistic. And so we talk to our members about the need for justice and equity and liberation. And we also talk about the reality of the worlds we know they're going into and we look to work with them to sort of orchestrate a path that is going to at least be transparent at at least and then when flags come that are like you know deal breakers we make a change but when there are ways to attack take on an issue and try to solve for it then that's the work honestly and it's not always easy but sometimes that's sort of the long view approach so again, you know, the best case scenario is you find your best partners and then you should highlight them and work with others and explain why they're the best and the strongest. And it's usually because they're going to have the most success. So you also get to brag about that as a retention from a business perspective. So um, it's very thorough, <laughs> uh, but intentional understanding of all the different pieces on both sides and then being able to come to a space in a, in a good partnership where you can actually name those things. And we're the climate team, right? So we do not run workforce programs. And I think most people um, understand that. Um, what I do want to add is that, again, our day to day is really about increasing ambition on climate and on sustainability, right? Which in turn creates new opportunity. And there are other teams within the, the administration, right? Who like Deputy Mayor Thompson team that the fellows work with so closely, um, you know, who, who's, who are thinking about how we do this econo equitable economic development and how do we weave that into our climate policies and our contracting um, and all of that. So we are uh, not only creating this pipeline for workforce and small business development, but we're also achieving our climate goals. So, you know, I, I just bring us back to, to, to you guys, right? And like, this is the setup we currently have at City Hall. We have offices whose job it is to think about that and to support programs like Tanya's, right? Like, um, and many other programs. Um, 
what will the next administration bring and, and ho how will we hold the, um, the next administration's feet to the fire so that we are continuing to expand right, job opportunities for economically disadvantaged communities? How do we continue to, to uh, push the state right, to see the kind of community hiring legislation that we want to see? How do we continue to push uh, for NYCHA residents and, and people from high uh, poverty communities to be connected and to have those pathways into, into um, sustainable and high paying jobs. Um, so, you know, I, I think that part of this is really thinking about all of us and, and all our roles in making sure that as the administrations change, that this mayor's office of economic opportunity or that this, uh, you know, strategic initiative team and, and this work uh, that has gone on on MWBs and so on, like just dies with this administration. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting more involved to ensure that that conversation continues as the, as the months go on, right? And, and I'm asking all, for all of you uh, within your own agencies, your own um, departments to, to, keep that, um, to keep that noise and, and to keep the recommendations of your report uh, front and center. Uh, what do you want to see happen and who should do it? And, and, and keep telling us that. Uh, so we have that onus to, to, to do the right thing and, and address that systemic inequality that we've had and been very comfortable with um, for centuries. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Kizzy, for that. Good reminder to vote. Vote and vote early, everybody. And, and thanks, Karen, for the question. Great. Thanks, Dan. Uh, and thanks, Tanya and Kizzy, for your responses. Yep. So with that, I'm going to thank Tanya and Kizzy for for building this bright and beautiful future that we all want to see in the city and also for fielding a few uh, hardballs from the fellows. Thank you guys. And uh, with that, I'm actually going to welcome on a couple of our fellows to say a few final words on behalf of the cohort. So I'm going to welcome on Sheila and Tira. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. So to start by stating the obvious, I think none of us really knew how the year would unfold when we embarked on this fellowship last fall. We all sort of went in with this initial hope of what we used to call the return to normal in New York City, but week after week, as we saw tragedy after tragedy repeat itself, it became evident very quickly that there would not be an equitable nor livable return to normal. So our ways of communicating and thinking constantly readapted as gaps in society continued to be revealed to us throughout the year. We discussed not only what job recovery might look like for communities of color out after the pandemic, but also what it might really mean to sustain an economic democracy. And while the fellowship largely began with the question of recovery through the lens of government, policy, and institutional reform alone, um, many of us, especially in the second phase, started shifting towards speculating around collective forms of care and community ownership and sort of strategizing around the ways in which the knowledge we've inherited through institutions could quite earnestly be reimagined, restructured, and replanted in an ideal society outside of capitalism. For myself and many in the cohort who have sometimes felt isolated in our professional disciplines by our deeply held values, our commitment to work and respond differently to the built environment outside of our jobs, the fellowship was a saving grace. Forefront was a unique opportunity that allowed us to formulate projects around design, planning, and policy in unprecedented ways um, rooted in a strong political disposition. So I wanna personally thank UDF for providing this opportunity and to all of you for your knowledge, inspiration, your mentorship, and your friendship. And I think I find a little bit of solace in knowing that because our fight is far from over, what we've built together continues to live on. I'll pass that to Tiara. Thank you, Sheila. The, the cooperative works Forefront Fellows and many New Yorkers are ready for a new normal, ready for change existing beyond models, pitches, and RFPs. Power holders have to accept that the system is extractive, exploitative, and in need of change. The presentations you all just witnessed are just a few examples of actionable steps towards community power and economic democracy. I also want to thank the Urban Design Forum for this opportunity, all of the stakeholders for their participation, and my fellow cohort for their continuous commitment. I can confidently speak for the cohort and say we hope to see the cause to action answered in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Tiara. Um, I don't know what else to say. My God, you took the words right out of my mouth. But so I'm going to do this. I'm just going to raise a glass. Final toast for our Forefront Fellows. Congratulations. 
we're eager to support you in any way we can. Feel free to turn on your videos and wave, applaud, whatever you want to do. Um, raise a glass. But really, like, thank you guys. You, you were an inspiration to me this year. And I don't know how I would have made it out through this without you. So congratulations, everybody. For those of you who are still in the audience, you know, get in touch. We, the teams want to keep advancing their work. And, and if you want to learn more, please let us know. We're happy to connect you. And uh, Forefront's not over. You know, we've got a new Forefront Fellowship Neighborhood Fair that's going to be focused on food equity in the built environment. So if you know any other brilliant, inspiring urbanists like the ones we saw tonight, please do check out our application at Urban Design Forum. But with that, I guess we'll do one last. I want every Forefront fellow who's on, please turn on your videos. Let's take a little group photo, maybe even raise a glass. Congratulations, everybody. And I'm looking forward to celebrating in person with many of you tomorrow night. Congratulations, everyone.